Hello. Well, happy Mother's Day. I'm really sorry we couldn't be together for this Sunday. Um, you should have gotten a letter in the mail, and I was also planning on posting it on Facebook, letting you know that we will be getting together again. We will be having uh, services together again in the sanctuary uh, beginning May 24th. Uh, that is the uh, decision that the leadership came to, the elders and the church board, as we discussed things together. Obviously, we'll continue watching what goes on in the, not, uh, well, the country, certainly, but also in our local uh, Fort Wayne area. And uh, if we feel we need to make some changes, we will. But at this point, we not only hope not, uh, we don't see where that would, would happen. So anyway, again, happy Mother's Day. Hope you're able to celebrate and remember and um, enjoy the day uh, with someone. So as I was working on this sermon for today, I remembered a game we used to play. Uh, it brought a lot of laughs. It was, it was a fun game. Um, it's uh, the dictionary game. Well, at least that's what we called it. Well, maybe. I guess I'm not quite sure what we called it. We played it with a dictionary. You got a dictionary out, you looked up a word, any word that you wanted. You shared that word with the group then everybody would write down a definition. Uh, some would try to be serious, some would try to be less than serious. And then also whoever chose the word would write down the real definition of the word. You would put also in a pile, the person who picked it would read the definitions one by one. If you happen to fool others and they chose your, yours, however many people chose your definition that wasn't real, you got a point. If they made it through the whole thing and nobody picked the real definition of the word, then the person choosing the word got even more points. So um, it, it was a lot of fun, and it could be a fun, uh, a fun time. Now, I enjoy messing with words, so that kind of a game appeals to me because I, I enjoy uh, messing with words, particularly pronunciation, or as I say in my house, pronunciation. The pronunciation of the words, and uh, I would do this to a point sometimes where my kids weren't quite sure if what I was saying was the right way to say it because they've heard me say it that way for so long, or if it was something that I was making up. So they were always a little, just a little uncertain about that. Um, an example is when something would happen, and it didn't always have to be good, um, I would say to our kids, oh, isn't that spatial? Meaning, isn't that special? I would just, I would use it sarcastically and I would use it realistically sometimes. But I always said, you know, now isn't that spatial? Well, spatial is a real word. It is a scientific word or a word used in science to explain uh, the relation of something in space or where it was in space. Uh, so when Marcy became a teacher, she came home one day and she, uh, she informed me, she said, Dad, she said, I was teaching my class today and we were teaching on spatial something or other. And she said, and every time I said that word, spatial, I just had to pause and think myself, now am I saying that word right or am I saying that word? Because Dad always said that word goofy like that. So um, it was just one of those things. Um, we can mess with words. We can, you know, we can we can horse around like that, uh, and we can have fun with that uh, and choosing definitions. Um, but what are you choosing to define what kind of person you are? You are choosing something. Your choices are are defining the kind of person you are. You know, whether you realize it or not, your choices are defining you. You you, you know, you may not like what they say. Um, uh, you might like what they say. Uh, you, you know, you, you might not have given it much thought, uh, but know that it is happening. Your choices are defining you. Uh, how other people see you and even, you know, how, how really how you operate through the world. Uh, now you might not agree with how other people see you, um, but you are defining yourself by your choices. Uh, choose your definition. That's what we're going to look at today. That's what we're going to think about today. Choose your definition. Let's pray. And then we'll get into our text. Father, thank you. Thank you for a time together, even um, like this. Um, it's not how we want, but we look forward in a couple of weeks to be able to be in together. 
Um, but what I pray right now is that you would help us. Help us to learn from your word. Help us to learn from your truth. Help us to learn to be more and more the people you are calling us to be. It's not always easy for us. We do well sometimes. Other times we fumble around quite a bit. So help us to see and learn as we look into your word what it means for us today, what it means for us now, what it means for us as we live our life, that hopefully we will live it more and more for you. Uh, but guide us with clarity from your word, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 42, so if you want to turn there, I plan on finishing the chapter today. We're actually going to begin in verse 27, so if you want to drop down to verse 27. Now, in the earlier chapters, Joseph uh, was in prison. Uh, Pharaoh had some dreams. Joseph was called to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. Joseph told Pharaoh what his dreams meant. Pharaoh was so impressed that he put Joseph in charge of, well, really in charge of Egypt. He was second only to Pharaoh. He was the one who was in charge of things. Uh, and then in chapter 42, as we move into chapter 42 here, there's a famine in the land. The end of chapter 41 uh, was the seven good years, the seven very good years, really. And uh, now just as God had said, those seven good years came to an end. And the seven years of famine, seven years of severe famine, uh, it would be hard enough. I think a famine would be pretty severe if it lasted seven years, but it said specifically there were seven years of severe famine coming. Now in the providence of God, Jacob, Joseph's father, um, sent ten of Joseph's brothers to Egypt to buy grain because the famine was so severe. Now Joseph recognized them as they came before him and bowed down in fulfillment of his dream that he had years ago. Uh, but Joseph was, seemed to be taken back a little bit. He didn't quite know, it seems, exactly how he should respond, and I, I believe he responded poorly at part of the time. He uh, treated his brothers poorly. It says he treated them harshly. Uh, first he throws them in jail, then he gets them out of jail, uh, then he gives them grain, uh, and he very generously gives them their money back, and uh, a very generous move on his part. Uh, then he throws Simeon back in jail, and he sends the rest of the brothers home to get Benjamin, the youngest brother. I think Joseph wanted to connect with his family, wanted to make sure Benjamin was okay. Well, that's where we pick up in verse 27 of Genesis chapter 42. It says, At the place where they lodged for the night, one of them opened his sack to get feed for his donkey, and he saw his money there at the top of his bag. He said to his brothers, My money has been returned. It's here in my bag. Their hearts sank. Trembling, they turned to one another and said, What is this that God has done to us? When they reached their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them. The man who was the lord of the country spoke harshly to us and accused us of spying on the country. But we told him we are honest and not spies. We were twelve brothers, sons of the same father. One is no longer living, and the youngest is now with our father in the land of Canaan. The man who was the lord of the country said to us, This is how I will know if you are honest. Leave one of your brothers with me. Take food to relieve the hunger of your households and go. Bring back your youngest brother to me, and I will know that you are not spies but honest men, and I will then give you uh, your brother back to you, and you can trade in the country. Well, we're going to pause there. It was a long trip back to uh, Canaan. And so as they traveled back to Canaan, they stopped to feed their animals, you know, like we stop at a gas station to stretch, you know, and get something to eat. Well, they stopped and they stopped to lodge for the night. Uh, when one of the brothers went to pull out some grain to feed their animals, uh, he noticed that the money that was in his, that what they were supposed to use to pay for the grain, that money was in the sack still. Um, well, I don't know, they probably assumed that whoever loaded the grain in the sacks forgot to collect the money. Now it says that they were troubled. They were troubled probably because they thought they would be seen as having stolen the grain without, having, without uh, paying for it. And they would be seen as thieves. They would be seen, uh, and they wouldn't be welcomed back. Or something would be happening to Simeon because your brothers took off and never paid for the grain. We're not told exactly why they're troubled, but that fact that they were troubled there. Um, I, rem I remember one time uh, we stopped uh, at a gas station and I, I went to pay for a few items. Um, and as I did, the lady rang up my purchases. And as she rang up the purchases, she seemed to be a little distracted, but she rang them up 
and uh, punch the numbers in and the cash drawer flies open. Well, she looks up at the register and sees the total and she gets, starts counting out money out of the cash drawer and turns and hands it to me, uh, counts it out for me and hands it to me. And I had a strange look on my face. And she looked at me, noticed that strange look, and she said, oh, oh, did you give me a 20? I said, well, I haven't given you anything yet. Well, man, she snatched that money back from me, you know, just, just about as quick as I, I, I grabbed free books at, at a, you know, at a conference. I, you know, she wanted it back, you know. Uh, well, here, you know, the brothers, the brothers think that maybe, you know, may, maybe, uh, you know, they were going to be seen as thieves or something. They were troubled. Uh, now, they complain God's picking on them. Uh, if you're thinking that way, get that out of your head. If you're thinking that God is, you know, get that out of your head right now if you think God is picking on you. God is not picking on you. God is not picking on you. In one sense, as I was thinking about this, I thought, well, that's kind of a um, pretty lofty thought of ourselves, you know, that God would, we would be the ones God would be picking on. Well, how, why in the world would you think God would pick on anyone? God doesn't pick on us. God's not out to make our lives miserable. He's not, he's not looking for us to step out of line so that he can slap us down. That's not what he wants at all. Um, you know, that's a very distorted picture of God. A very distorted picture. Uh, we read before, we'll look at it again, Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything. God's not looking to, to, he's not picking on us. He provided for us with the death of his son. If he gives us a son, what in the world would he ever withhold from us? Second Peter chapter one, verse three says, his divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. God called us by his own glory and goodness. He, he gave us his son. He called, he is, uses his power. You know, give us, it says, everything that is required for life and godliness. He is trying to help us succeed. He is trying to help us make it. He is trying to help us be all he's called us to be. He's not trying to destroy us. He's not picking on you. Well, here the brothers get back home to Canaan and, and their father. And no doubt, uh, Jacob probably noticed, hey, uh, Simeon's missing, you know, Simeon, Simeon's not here. Oh, well, they tell Jacob then about their experience in Egypt. And they did pretty well relating what, what happened to him. Well, certainly it was from their perspective until they get to verse 34. In verse 34, uh, he, he, they said, uh, you know, that, that the, the uh, man in charge said, bring back, back your youngest brother to me and I will know that you are not spies but honest men. I will then give your brother back to you and you can trade in the country. Well, that was a lie. Well, that was a lie. Uh, you know, Joseph told them very clearly to bring their younger brother back and then they could live and not be killed. In fact, he says it more than once. Verse 18, if you back up in the chapter uh, to what we read in, in the weeks previous, uh, verse 18, it says, On the third day Joseph said to them, I fear God, do this and you will live. Now, in case they didn't get it, he, he gets their attention again and very specifically says to them, verse 20, it says, Bring your youngest brother to me so that your words can be confirmed and you won't die. And they consented to this. They consented to this, it says. They knew what Joseph had told them. They didn't know it was Joseph. They knew what this man had told them. And it wasn't that they could trade in the country. It was bring him back and you won't die. Uh, well, we saw last week, don't lie. You know, don't lie. Here, they're, they're lying. You, know, you, you want to know more about God? Don't lie. You, know, you, you want to grow closer to God? Then don't lie. Uh, you know, what do you want to choose? What, what are you going to choose for your definition? Now, you know, if you don't want to be known as a liar, then don't lie. Don't lie. If you lie, you are choosing your def part of the definition you are choosing for yourself then is that you're a liar and can't be trusted. Well, seems like a no brainer. God's people shouldn't lie. Uh, you know, we say, you know, but, but they're only trying to spare their, their father some grief here. They didn't spare him any grief. They didn't spare him any grief at all. They were trying to protect themselves. That's what they were doing here. Don't lie. 
and don't excuse lying. Again, we hit that we hit that last week more. Just a little Greek cap for you. Pick up again, verse thirty-five. As they began emptying their sacks, there in each man's sack was his money, his bag of money. When they and their fathers saw their bags of money, they were afraid. Their father Jacob said to them, "You have deprived me of my sons. Joseph is gone, and Simeon is gone. Now you want to take Benjamin." Everything happens to me. Then Reuben said to his father, You can kill my two sons if I don't bring them back to you. Put them in my care, and I will return him to you. But Jacob answered, My son will not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he alone is left. If anything happens to him on your journey, you will bring my gray hairs down to Sheol in sorrow. Well, that was quite a statement, you know, talking to one of his sons, and he's talking as if he only had two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. Um, but look at what is going on here. You know, they, they come back, they empty the grains out of their sack. Jacob finds out they all got their money back. Now it seems the brothers uh, said, you know, kind of were, oh, why, look, we got our money back. I, I don't know, we're not told the details. I certainly would have checked had I gone traveling with someone uh, like that on that journey, they got their money back. I would have checked my sack then. I would have checked my sack, you know, back when, um, w when they stopped for to feed the animals, when they stopped and lodged for the night. I would have checked my sack then. Well, at any rate, uh, the sight of the the sight there of the money is uh, troubling to them. Um, and Jacob, that Jacob, it's interesting. He's called Jacob here throughout this chapter, you know, and and, and in this area, in these areas, as he's struggling, he's called is he was name was changed to Israel, and again later he'll be referred to as Israel, as you go through, um, as you continue on through, uh, you know, well, really the Old Testament. But uh, here he's referred to as Jacob again, and he's he's kind of a downer, really. I mean, look what he's saying. He's saying, "You rotten kids, what have you done? You know, what have you done?" Why does everything happen to me? You know, why does everything happen to me? You know, self-pity uh, gives us a very distorted picture of life. And it gives us a very distorted picture of God. When self-pity is what's giving us a direction, when self-pity is what, is what we are responding from, everything happens to me, oh, poor me, oh, if you only knew the trouble I've had, if you only know the trouble I've seen. And here, you know, it, it gives a very distorted picture. Self-pity leads us nowhere but down. It doesn't lead us up. Self-pity never, never rises. Self-pity defeats. Self-pity drags down. Self-pity destroys, really. And this is what's happening here. You know, nowhere but down. Uh, you know, you want to be fine. You, you want to be defined as a downer. You want to be defined as a drag. You know, as as a mope. You know, you want to be known as somebody who sucks the life. You know, out of others. You know, somebody. You want to you want to be defined as somebody who others want to avoid. Self-pity is a quick way there. Just seeing life on how it affects you negatively, always. Well, Jacob here, he, he assumes that Simeon was dead already. I think he probably, well, we were told earlier when they threw Joseph in the pit and uh, sold him into slavery, and they brought uh, Joseph's coat of many colors back. They had dipped it in animal blood, uh, making it appear that Joseph was dead. So Jacob already assumes Joseph was dead, it seems. And now Simeon wasn't back, and he didn't see where there was any hope there for Simeon. And, you know, he sees that uh, and assumes Simeon's dead too. Uh, the loss of a child is devastating. There is no, it is life altering. It's, some of you have gone through this, and man, my heart breaks for you. But here is the challenge for us don't allow tragedy to define you. And that almost sounds cruel to say in this situation. 
um, we can learn, and I would hope come back stronger. Uh, that's that should be the picture. But don't allow tragedy to define you. One of my aunts lost two children. Uh, this was my mother's oldest sibling. Um, I'm not really sure of the age span. I know there were um, eight children, my mother being number eight. This aunt was number one. She was the first child born. Um, she lost uh, a daughter when this daughter was a toddler. I was told that she was two years old. Now she would have been much older than myself. Um, but, uh, you know, I heard good things about her and, you know, that she passed when she was two years old. Um, but then that wasn't all. This aunt also lost a son. The son was a Chicago fireman and was tragically killed in the line of duty. In fact, it was on the news, and I remember watching and listening to it as it unfolded, and they were, he was trapped in a fire at a Commonwealth Edison plant. That's the electric company out there. And uh, they were trying to rescue him out of there. And it dragged on for hours on TV. Uh, but uh, he, di he didn't make it. Uh, throughout her life, though, this aunt was always just a picture of grace and gentleness. I never saw her wallowing in self-pity. I never even saw her mentioning anything that would remotely seem to be self-pity. I never heard her complain. Jacob here is the complete opposite. He says, why does everything happen to me? Why does everything happen? He was, he was being, he was letting that tragedy define him instead of looking to see and looking to grow in what God would have for him. You see, you choose what you're going to focus on. You choose what you're going to focus on. We all have hard things come into our life. And again, this would be devastatingly hard. But we all have some of those devastatingly hard things that come into our life. And you choose what you will focus on. You're looking either for the good or you're going to focus on the negative. After my radiation treatments, I had to have uh, my tumors rescanned every six months and then every year. And I had to have them scanned, uh, go through the MRI, and then go have them analyzed and uh, that, then go meet with the doctors. I had three doctors um, that took care of that whole situation. Um, I would go see two of them on the same day. I would go see my radiation oncologist and the uh, neurosurgeon. I would go see those two on the same day. Ginny referred to one of them as the glass half empty guy and she referred to the other one as the glass half full guy. Well, we were in about two and a half years at my two and a half year checkup. Um, we went and saw the glass half empty guy first. He came in and his first words, even as he's coming through the door, he didn't even have the door closed yet. And he said, well, that looks pretty good. And I said, well, I think that's good coming from you. The next words out of his mouth were, but you're not out of the woods yet. <laughs> There's that glass half empty part. Uh, you know, my tumors, my tumors had done better than they expected, but this guy, you know, let me know that I wasn't out of the woods yet. You know, there was still, there was still a concern. And I appreciate that. I mean, he's my doctor. He's a good doctor. I, I think all my doctors were good doctors. Well, then later that day, we went to see the glass half full guy. He came in and he looked at, uh, he sat down and he looked at us and he said, if we would have simply been able to get your tumors to stop growing, that was their goal, to get them to stop growing. He said, if we would have simply been able to get these tumors to stop growing, I would have considered this a success. He said, but your tumors have actually shrunk a little bit. He said, you know, he let us know that we were way beyond what they expected. The glass half full guy. Now they both looked at the same evidence. They both looked the same test. They both looked at the same reports. They both looked at the same MRIs. The one guy though, well, you know, we got two very different responses. You choose what you focus on. 
You know, you choose what you focus on. Jacob here, he was complaining because he looked only at the circumstances as they affected him. How did it affect him? And he only looked at them from a human standpoint. And that's what I'm saying, you know, we choose what we're going to focus on. He was only looking at it from a human standpoint. Some of the things we go through will be with us forever. I seriously doubt that any of you are going to forget about this pandemic and what's been going on. I seriously doubt it. This will be one of those moments that will be a life-defining moment that where you will remember things that unfolded and things that happened. That's exactly what's going to happen here. What we need to remember is the thing that Jacob was overlooking. You know, God was still working. Even though it wasn't obvious to Jacob, God was still working. It wasn't obvious to Jacob because Jacob chose not to look at God here. He only looked at how the situation affected him. What are you looking at as we're going through this? Are you only looking at how it's affecting you or are you looking to God and what does God have for me here? What does God want me to see? How am I using this time to draw closer to God? Is it, what, what are you, don't let the situation make you think that God isn't working. Jacob said, why does everything happen to me? Where, you know, his, his sons, why did God do this to us? Don't let the situation make you think that God isn't working or that you know, God's plan isn't unfolding. Don't think it's out of control. Don't think the situation now that we're living in, this time we're living through, don't think that this is out of control. It's not out of control. It is still the providence of God unfolding. Does that mean the disease is the providence of God? Again, we can make all sorts of debates and arguments about this. What I'm telling you is this situation is not out of God's control. The providence of God is still active, still at work. It's still under his control. One of my favorite verses, it's probably one I would choose as one of them that I would choose as a life verse for me. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. It is still true, even in the most troubling situations, even in the hardest thing you ever, the most, the most uh, uh, life-altering situation you have to go, it is still true. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose. I want to share with you something here. When it says we know that all things work together for good, that the phrase all things, what that means is all things. It means everything. It means there is nothing in your life, nothing that comes into your life that God can't use for good when you turn it over to him. That God, there is nothing that is out of God's realm of using for a redemptive purpose in your life. Nothing beyond him using to make you all that he's wanted to be. God works all things together for the ultimate good of his people. Yes, here on earth as well as in eternity. You see, but if eternity's out of view, then here on earth really doesn't matter. Uh, you know, we don't always see it while we're in the midst of it. We don't always see it while we're in the midst of it, but it's true. God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Well, with Jacob and his sons here, it moves from the ridiculous to the utterly foolish. Reuben, his plan, send Benjamin with me. If he doesn't come back, you can kill my two sons. What? What? You know, Reuben says to his father, let me go. If I, fail, if I fail to bring Benjamin back to you, well, then you can kill two of your grandsons. What in the, what is this man thinking? Where is his head? He let this, this situation give him a false view of his rights. He let it give him a false view of his abilities. He had no right to offer the life of his sons. He had no right to do that. You know, suppose he failed. Would he be able to give his sons over to his father so that his father could kill them? He grossly underestimated what was going on. And whatever made him think this would be something that God would approve of? Whatever made him think that God would approve of this? That God would approve of the taking of a life? All the way back, you know, from Cain and Abel. And God then didn't approve of the taking of a life. 
he hadn't changed his mind. You know, he, he hadn't changed his mind a bit. You know, the, the, the taking of, what, you know, what made him think that this was something God would approve of? Well, I hope it would never be about taking a life, but here's the, you know, for us, you know, don't ever make a promise that goes against God's word. Never. Not even a little thing. Don't ever make a promise that goes against God's word. There is never a situation where that is okay. There is never a situation where it is okay to go against God's word. That is, there is never a situation where that is a good choice. Never. You know, never a situation where going against God's word is acceptable. It just doesn't exist. Well, Jacob wasn't moved by the offer anyway. Verse 38, Jacob answered, My son will not go down with you, for his brother is dead and he alone is left. If anything happens to him on your journey, you will bring my gray hairs down to Sheol in sorrow. When they talk about going to Sheol, he's just talking about going to the afterlife. That's how they referred to it there. But notice Jacob's responding here, and he's responding from his feelings. Now, we, we, understand, we understand that. But it's a very poor way to handle a decision. Later, really, what's going to, what's going to change, he's going to have to change this decision. He's going to allow Benjamin to go later. We're going to get into that as we walk through the rest of these chapters. But, you know, very poor. Don't make decisions based on feeling alone. I'm not saying exclude your feelings. What I'm saying is don't lead with your feelings. Don't lead with your feelings. Lead with the Word of God. Lead with your relationship with God. You know, the, choose your definition and choose that God is going to define you and God is going to define how it is you go through life. You know, don't make decisions based on feeling alone. We need to look for the leading of God and we need to follow him rather than our feelings. If the leading of God goes against our feelings, but I have this feeling, go with God, don't go with your feelings. Go with what God has to say. You know, God's patient, he waits, you know, uh, and he waited for Jacob here. But I really wonder, what opportunities did they miss? What opportunities did they miss because of this decision? Now, it's not that Jacob was unconcerned about his son, but the answer settled really on how Jacob would feel. Notice, you know, he's saying, I don't want him to go because if, if something happened to him, I would just be too sad. I would just be too sad. What are you choosing during this pandemic? What are you choosing? What does it say about you? It's saying something about you. You know, you choose how you will respond to every event that comes into your life. You are choosing how you are responding to everything that's unfolding right now. You are making that choice. Yes, some choices, some, some situations are hard. Some are crushing. There's no question about it. Some are crushing. Um, you don't ignore them. You're affected by them. There's no question about it. But don't be defined by events. Be defined by your relationship with God. Be defined by your relationship with God, not the events that are unfolding, not what you find yourself in the middle of, but de be defined by your relationship with God. Now take a moment. Just take a moment and consider what your choices are saying about you. What are they saying? Do you choose to live like God is picking on you? If you do, you know, others will hear that. They'll hear what you have to say about your situation. That'll be their picture of God and their picture of you. You know, are you choosing to live under self-pity? That's only going to give you a distorted picture of reality. It's only going to give you a very distorted picture of God if you only see it under self-pity. You know, are you allowing tragedy to define you? And again, tragedy happens to us. Now the question is, you know, are we taking it to God? Some of you are still living under some past tragedies and allowing those to define you. Take it to God, open that part of your life to him, and allow him to heal you. Take those past tragedies in your life to God and allow him to heal you. You've heard before, these things are going to make you bitter or they're going to make you better. Let them make you better. Healing can be painful. 
It can be painful. You know, think about it. When you're healing from surgery, it's painful. You're getting, some of you are getting treatments for cancer or some other situation. They're painful, you know, and it's painful. But, you know, it's, the healing process is beneficial. Take them to God. Allow him to heal you. What about troubles? Are you choosing to focus on your troubles? Look to how God is working in and through your troubles. Look to see how he is working in and through what we're in the midst of now. All of us have been affected by this. Even if you say, well, you know, it doesn't really bother me, but you've been staying home. Or you have places you wanted to go, you couldn't go. We're all being affected, greater or lesser degrees. How, you know, look and see, how is God working in the midst of this still? Because he is. You know, and then don't let any situation make you think that God is not working. God is working for your ultimate good. Here and in eternity. Here, don't forget that part. And in eternity. You know, and then don't choose to make promises that go against God's word. Never. Don't ever make a promise that don't ever don't ever make a promise that goes against God's word. That's so foolish, a foolish way to live. And don't make choices based on feelings alone. Look to God for guidance. Allow him to guide you. Allow him to direct you. And don't be defined by events. Make choices to be defined by your relationship with God. Make those choices. And make those choices obvious. Make your commitment to God, make your relationship to God obvious. Make choices to be defined by your relationship with God. Always. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word and your truth. Thank you for examples we can see here. We don't want to live through all the trouble. And Lord, some of us have. Some of my brothers and sisters here who are watching this, they've gone through some tragedy that would destroy most people. I pray that you would bring healing to their hearts, healing to their souls, let them know of your love. Let them know of your mercy and your grace. And let them know of your presence. And for all of us, Father, that we would turn to you. That we would not be defined. That we would not be defined by what's happening. Or what's happening to us. But that we would be defined by our relationship with you. Help us toward that end, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, in a couple of weeks, I'll be doing this in the sanctuary to some of you. Now, some of you shouldn't come. You know, some of you are, are in a compromised health condition. You shouldn't come. We don't want you to be sick. We will still be posting videos online. We will still be putting them on there. Uh, we will still put them up so that you can see them. Um, be careful. Be focused on God. Be joyful and be following his leading in all you do. Until I see you face to face, know that we love you.